action item. Uh, so we start off with our truth and taxation public hearing. So this is why the students are actually here. Yeah. Their parents told them to come and <laughs> All right. <coughs> All right, Mayor and Council Member, uh, the item in front of you tonight is something that we have an annual obligation uh, to provide. So it's called our Truth and Taxation Public Hearing. And basically under Minnesota state statute, uh, the establishment of a tax levy is really handled in multiple phases. So we started that process back in September. I think it was September 17th. Uh, we uh, held our uh, meeting to establish our preliminary tax levy. Uh, and at that time, we took the information that we had uh, from the county, looking at valuations, <laughs> looking at changes in, in uh, new market construction, things like that, along with some of the needs that we saw going into the future, and be able, were able to provide, based on our tax levy policy, an indication to the public of what we we're thinking about for setting our tax levy for the 2019 year. What happens then is that those uh, that number is then used by the county to basically have a statement sent to you. Uh, every taxing jurisdiction actually goes through the same process. So the school district, the county, uh, the city, and then we have some special taxing jurisdictions too, uh, which translates into a notice that you should have received in the mail probably about a week and a half to two weeks ago uh, that says uh, basically three things. It says, here's your valuation before, here's what it is now, Here's what each taxing jurisdiction is uh, proposing uh, for their 2019 tax, and, and here's what their uh, here's what it was in 2018, and then it gives information that if they're interested in making comment uh, on uh, the proposed budget or the levy, that they can at the truth and taxation hearing, which is tonight. Now we take no action tonight. Basically, this is an opportunity for us to be able to provide to the public. Uh, our rationale uh, for what we're providing uh, for establishing a tax levy, provide our proposed budget for the general fund for 2019, and then be able to take any public comment that we can consider uh, before we establish the tax levy and the budget at our December 17th meeting, which is our, our second meeting in December. So. Uh, no action taken tonight other than to just uh, accept any public comment or and to, to establish December 17th as the meeting to actually uh, take formal action on this. Uh, so uh, basically what I'm going to go through now is some of the rationale for the recommendation that's being made. This is very similar uh, for what the council has seen uh, before, uh, but may be new to the, the public uh, that's... Uh, might be seeing this for the first time. So the major uh, items, you know, first of all, I look back at the past year and say, what are some of the major items that we looked at in 2018, which really sort of drove our budget last year? And then how does that translate into 2019 and what we're looking at for this upcoming year? So in 2018, uh, we had the full implementation of our capital improvement program. That was something that took us over four years to, to get in place. We identified back in 2014 a million dollar gap in being able to properly fund our general fund uh, obligations for taking care of things like parks, roads, trails, those things that already exist that people expect that we reinvest back into. Uh, we identified, uh, you know, five years ago now, a million dollar gap and basically said uh, that we take the next four years to basically fill that gap so that we had it fully funded after that time period. 2019 will actually uh, will be continuing forward with that, and we're reaping the full benefits of being able to uh, keep up with things. And I'll explain some of the projects that we're looking at. Uh, continued utilization of our, our uh, tax levy policy, which I'll go through. Uh, last year, we did see the complete loss of local government aid uh, from the state. We did recapture half of that through our tax levy. And then uh, we're continuing to look at this idea of sustainability of our services uh, from a resource perspective, staffing and facilities, uh, compared to the uh, delivery service level expected by residents. So the 19 items that we want to discuss is, you know, uh, what specific projects are we looking at for a capital improvement pro uh, project? What does our tax levy policy say uh, or would indicate uh, for setting our tax levy for 2019? 
Uh, big new item, it's really the only big new item that we have for 2019 is the addition of a code compliance, a community service officer uh, service added to our service levels, which I'll explain in, in further detail. And then we continue to look at this idea of sustainability of our services. We actually are just finishing up a, a, basically a, a staffing resource study through our financial advisor, Springstead, which they're coming back with recommendations uh, that we're going to be looking at in 2019 to look at over the next five to ten years, what do we really need to be planning for as we move from the notion of being a developing community to being a fully developed community, and what does that mean as far as, as, far as what we uh, need for resources to do that. So our objectives, I think every, uh, everything we do, we try to revolve around objectives that we have for here. So first and foremost is our mission. We need to make sure that what we're doing from a budget perspective is uh, reflecting what we want for our mission, which is to be the best small town in Minnesota. Uh, maintain existing high quality service levels, uh, limit our tax levy growth to capture only new growth in the community, uh, and expenditure inflation, and that we'd only increase our tax levy beyond that if we had a new service that we were adding, and the cost of that new service would dictate what that increase would be. Fully fund the maintenance and replacement of our vehicles and equipment, and any physical assets that we have. Uh, only fund uh, new programs after our existing uh, necessary programs are funded. Uh, budget, budget to utilize a, a plan that avoids drawdown in our general fund reserve. Uh, fully fund our street reconstruction uh, needs, and we've seen that over the last decade that we've basically every year have been constructing, you know, within three years we're going to have every street in downtown Chaska completely reconstructed, which is a huge accomplishment. Uh, but it's it started with an objective. Uh, and then develop a long-term budget plan that's sustainable from a resource perspective uh, to support those service levels that uh, residents expect. So when we look at establishing the budget, tax levy, things like that, we need to understand the environment uh, which we're working in. So first of all, the first thing we look at is existing property values and where our property values are going into the, the future uh, because our main source of income or a main source of income is our property taxes, which is driven, driven by property values. So uh, 2015, uh, we saw 8.2% uh, increase in overall growth, about 2.33 in new uh, growth. 2016, we saw 3.18% uh, overall growth, 2% of that in new growth. Uh, in 17, we saw 7.85% uh, overall growth, 2.3% of that was new. And then in 18, last year, we saw 5.72% overall growth, 1.7% of that was new. Now, the, one, the reason that I put the new in there is one of the things we have to remember with new value is these are properties that are completely new to the community. And so um, basically, as they come in, if we want to make sure that they're paying their fair share towards services that we have in the community, we have to, at the very least, be able to accommodate bringing those values into the community. Because if we don't, then those new properties basically aren't contributing equitably to the uh, to the services that are having to be increased because of the additional residents that we have in the community. Uh, we, do, uh, we do not have any local government aid from the state, uh, and we don't uh, expect that going into the future. Uh, we continue to have relative stability in, in building permits. Uh, 2017 and 18 uh, have been pretty strong years. Uh, <coughs> I do think the one thing we're going to have to keep an eye on is interest rates going up and any impact that that may have on building. Uh, so we're, we're looking at that when we sort of come back at our next meeting and establish our, our final uh, recommendation for, for building permit revenue. We continue to have a steady increase in population occurring. I do think in 19, when we start to see this interchange being developed, I think that's going to potentially have the impact of speeding up uh, development in that area. Uh, our electric usage continues to be up, uh, up significantly, and we really continue to have a good balance of residential, commercial, industrial in the community, and that's really always been a strength of this community is really having a balance of, of development. So you can see for, so the 2018 market values are established now for taxes payable in 2019. So they're established back uh, on uh, just prior to July 1st, and then they impact for taxes payable in 2019. 
you can see that uh, our overall increase in value in the community was $161 million. Uh, we're almost up to $3 billion in value uh, in the community. So we've seen some very healthy growth uh, in the community. Uh, you can see new uh, construction made up about $50 million of that value. Uh, existing residential properties uh, made up 3.91% of the growth in residential, which was about 5.9%. And the overall uh, growth that we saw in our market values was 5.72%. So pretty similar to last year. Uh, as far as market value distribution, you can see about 72% of our value uh, goes to residential, about 14% commercial industrial, 13% uh, apartment, and other represents like ag property that's undeveloped uh, in the community. Um, but it's a good mix. Um, we, we definitely aren't just a bedroom community. Uh, we have uh, over 13,000 jobs in the community, uh, which with the number of households we have, we have about 10 to 11,000 households, so we have more jobs than we do households in the community. Our ultimate goal is to have two jobs per household. Uh, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to work in Chaska, but that we have that many jobs here. And our, I should mention our comp plan and the future development trends support that goal of meeting that two jobs per household based on what development uh, activity we still have to go. So market values, you can see we've seen uh, an increase. Uh, you can see the dip uh, that occurred between 2000, 2009 and, and uh, 2012 um, or 2013. Uh, keep in mind that even though the recession started in 2008, these always get impacted one year out. And so you can see where the recession hit, um, where that dip and the market values occurred. And I think one thing that I think is really important to, to look at is, you know, that started in about 2008, 2009. It wasn't until about 2016 that we saw the market values get back up to where they were before. Mm -hmm. It took almost a decade uh, to recapture the lost value uh, that we had in the community. So that was a, a pretty uh, sharp hit uh, for uh, the community and not just our community, but other communities around as well. So the market value change has, is provided would actually uh, provide for an uh, increase to our tax capacity of about 5.6%. <coughs> so I put in what new construction values would be because, again, uh, you know, one thing to, to keep in mind is back when we were going through the recession period, there was four years that we had 0% increase in our tax levy. And... Uh, even during those years, we saw new growth in the community. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's to really show that uh, re if we're a growing community, uh, there's going to be things that add on to our service level, whether we increase our tax levy or not. And so uh, I think one of the things that, that we did back in the 2015 timeframe was really uh, establish a tax levy policy that really took into consideration that uh, we need to be equitable on how we look at establishing our, our uh, tax levy uh, so that everybody's really paying their fair share towards the, the costs that they're associated with providing our general government services. Why is there such a drop in 18? Um, what was that now? Well, there's quite a drop from 17 to 18. But did we have a big commercial project in there that, yes. that could have been the data center? I was going to say there was a data center. We saw, I think it was. A uh, data center, that explains it. Yeah, and data center, and we also saw a large apartment project at the same time. And so sometimes, I mean, two big projects like that can really impact it. But also keep in mind it's a difference between 2.2 and 1.6%. So. It may look like a big drop, but it's not a huge percentage drop. Yeah. Oops. Um, local government aid, uh, we went from a million uh, at the early part of this last decade to basically zero, and we are at zero now. 
Uh, last year, we did recapture through our tax levy half of that back, uh, so it was about $128,000. Our budget proposal this year basically says that we keep in place that decision that was made uh, last year going into the future. Uh, building permits, uh, we definitely have seen uh, that increase. You can definitely see that dip when we got into that 2008-2009 time period. Uh, you see that one spike up that happened uh, like in 2010 or 11? That was either the hospital or the data center. That was the data center. That was the data center. Oh, I thought it was the hospital. It always did that. Yeah. Um, so we saw <coughs> one sort of a, we were very much in the minority by seeing that type of uh, activity. Uh, and you can see sort of where the trends were going. Uh, right now, I. We're being really cautious now as we look at the building permits. And in fact, one of the things as we're sort of going through, what you're gonna to see tonight is a draft budget. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at over the next two weeks before we bring it back to you is, where do we really think the building per permit numbers should be? Because uh, there are gonna be factors that, that influence this as we go into the future, rising interest rates, rising cost of construction material, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. We see lots of projects on the horizon, but until they actually break ground, it's a different story. So we, we wanna, it's the one real variable part of our general fund budget uh, that um, we're ultra sensitive to because the rest of them are pretty stable uh, revenue sources, but that's a, that's a variable. And so we wanna be careful where we set that. So you're likely gonna see a change between now and December 17th of the actual amount of building per re revenue that we budget. I'm thinking we're probably gonna drop it about $50,000. Uh, so it's going to be relatively similar, maybe a little bit less to what it was this year. Population continues to rise, though. And, you know, we, we are at about 150 new uh, people a year. Uh, that puts us right now, 2018, we're about 26,500 uh, residents. In our five-year planning horizon, we think we're going to be uh, just over 28,000. So we're, we're adding... Uh, you know, about 450 people uh, a year into the community, which is really interesting because uh, the school district is gonna be talking a lot about this coming up in the next year. Um, my gut tells me that they're gonna be, you know, they have a lot of maintenance needs, but they're probably also gonna have some needs for more elementary space. Uh, their elementary schools accommodate about 600 uh, people. Well, you know, if you consider the Carver Elementary School opened last year, and we add 150 new residents a year. By the time they'd actually get something built, we've added about 600 <laughs> residents. Well, so have the other communities too. And uh, you know, when you add that, uh, that number of, of people, uh, there's gonna be a certain percentage that are gonna be in that elementary school age. So you can see that they probably pretty quickly fill up another elementary school. As far as the electric franchise fee, this is uh, one that we continue to see Pretty tremendous growth and it's really come from two areas um, it's come from our data centers uh, there in the community but it's also come from expansion of our existing industrial buildings uh, within the uh, the community so if you look up into our north industrial area a lot of the buildings were built in the mid 80s to early 90s and we're really starting to see those expand now I think back in at that time I think the community was really smart to really incentivize companies to uh, basically not just buy enough to build their building, but buy enough built, uh, land to be able to include an expansion. And so, um, uh, so they planned for these expansions back then so that companies knew they had a place to be able to move to, and that's kept these companies here. And so that's been a strategic advantage that Chaska has had that a lot of other communities just have not had. And so uh, we've seen that impact our electric franchise, which makes up 10, it's basically 10% uh, contribution from our uh, every kilowatt hour that's uh, purchased, 10% of that comes back to our general fund through a franchise fee. So as far as our discussion items in 2019, uh, you know, I've already mentioned some of these areas, but we'll sort of break them down into to different components. So as far as the operational tax levy, Again, there's three components uh, that our tax levy policy addresses. One is uh, new growth in the community, and we saw uh, new growth in the community at about 1.7% uh, 
uh, increase in market values. The second influencing factor gets to our action. So the new <coughs> growth uh, uh, means that we have additional services to provide, or we have more people to provide those services to. Inflation gets into how much more does it cost to provide the same service that we provided last year. And so inflation is about 3%. So those two items, so the 1.7% plus the 3% is 4.7%. If we were to add no other service, uh, new service in the community, we'd be recommending a 4.7% increase in our tax levy. But as we talked about be before, the third component to that is any new service that's added in our community. Uh, as you guys are aware, one of the things that's been talked about quite a bit over the last six months is the addition of our code compliance division within our uh, police department. As we become an aging community, and you guys, I, I would venture to say 85% of the calls that you guys get have to do with code compliance issues. Mm -hmm. My neighbor has junk in their yard. You know, my, my neighbor is doing this. Uh, this building's not complying with that. They got junk sitting out. All these different things that really impact people's property values and really impact people's quality of life within a community. And I can tell you, after you know being here for almost 20 years, the most frustrating thing that a resident runs into is a neighbor that they can't control what they're doing because they feel like they're completely helpless. Well, we have ordinances in place to be able to address these, but we've never been resourced at a, at a level to be able to address them other than being reactive to them. And so really by adding this code compliance division, especially as we're becoming more of an aging community and going to be fully developed within the next 20 years, this is going to become more of an issue. And so really staffing at a level to be able to deal with this on a proactive basis it's not to go out and uh, you know, nitpick people for things. In fact, the strategy or approach that we're going to use is try to simplify it as much as possible. One of the first things they're working on now is to go back and really sort of address our code of ordinances. I mean, some of our code of ordinances are from a long time ago, and they don't make sense anymore. And so simplifying our ordinances to get down to the things that are most important to our community to be able to have some control over, to go out, to give people, so you know, maybe divide the city into four quadrants and, and you know, for two weeks we're focusing in this quadrant and we put out notice to people saying, here's the 10 things we're gonna be looking for so that people have fair notice to be able to be educated on stuff. And then being able to follow through with it to make sure that if they don't, that you know, we're providing that enforcement to make sure that people are consistently being treated. So I really think that this is going to be a, a really big uh, positive impact in the community. Now, this is one of those types of things that if it isn't done right, could be a real negative because mm -hmm. uh, nobody likes to be told what to do. Uh, but I think if we can do it in an approach that really uh, it, you know, focuses on those things, you know, getting input from the residents about what are the most important things uh, for you guys to see the city in, you know, enforcing. And picking out those, you know, the 10, you know, the things we're gonna focus on that, you know, that the residents say this, this is important to us. I think if we do this right, I think it can be really a positive thing for the community. That's about $190,000 cost, and that adds on about 2.4% uh, onto a tax levy for a total percentage of 7.1%. So our capital improvement program, that's a portion of the budget that's, uh, that now has been fully funded uh, for the past couple of years now. Uh, so in 2019, uh, we have a million dollars allocated to it. Uh, $350,000 is gonna go towards street overlay uh, program, and I believe that the street overlay this year is uh, an extension of the stuff over on Audubon Road. They did the south half of sort of the Hazeltine or the South Southridge. I can't remember now. Um, so basically, there's there's the stuff that's sort of on the bluff and then going north into Hazeltine. So across from. Uh... It's slipping my mind. Yeah. Basically, finishing up the stuff over by Audubon. Uh, road uh, doing the overlays uh, over there. So every 20 years, if we want to extend and keep the life of a uh, infrastructure, the roads uh, in, in good shape. So every 10 years, we need to do a seal code. Every 20 years, we need to do an overlay. And if we do that, the road should last <coughs> 60 to 70 years. 
Uh, trail upgrades, overlays, uh, we uh, budget in $60,000, so it's $20,000 per mile, so that allows us to do three miles per year of uh, overlaying. Uh, we have a new pedestrian bridge on our main trail system down in East Creek that needs to get replaced, that's $70,000. Uh, we have a landscape wall replacement. We have a failing landscape wall over on Clayhole Lake behind Cooper's, Clayhole number two lake behind Cooper's uh, that uh, needs to get replaced. That's a pretty expensive one. That's about $200,000, but it is one that needs to be done. Is the bridge going to, or that little pier <coughs> going to be done then as well or not? Maybe. We're still looking at what to do with that. Uh, so our emergency sirens, uh, we, uh, our emergency sirens were, I don't know, 30 years old, and we've been going over the last few years replacing all of our emergency sirens within the community. So siren number two, this is the one closest to the community center, uh, gets replaced uh, next year. That's $25,000. Uh, there's a number of different things that we need to do within our uh, municipal service building because that's a pretty active um, uh, building. Uh, Parks moving all the time, so we put about $45,000 a year into that. And then the two park improvements that we have for this next year, so Pertina Woods Playground and Trail, uh, trail System, that's the one that is on the entrance uh, right along Purple Brick Road uh, that goes up to the high school. There's that park there, so that's uh, in need of replacement and work done there. We actually uh, are... I can't remember if that park is irrigated or not, but neighborhood parks that aren't irrigated, we're looking at irrigating so that we don't become the standout property in, in neighborhoods when it gets dry. Um, and then Lions Park Shelter. Uh, this is one that we actually bumped up uh, specifically because of the improvements we made with the dog park there down there. We're going to be reapproaching the Chaska Lions to see uh, they had indicated an interest in partnering with us uh, on this in the past. Uh, we've allocated dollars towards the improvements here. I want to talk to them about the potential of uh, really doing a more robust uh, improvement to Lions Park Shelter to really match up with the improvements that we've done with the dog park there. And I know that's one that's been a, a key for, for the council for the past <laughs> couple of years. Bad. <laughs> it's in pretty yeah. bad shape. Pretty bad shape. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, we're talking about upgrade or overlay on the trails and such. We've talked before, I know, about a new trail or a new sidewalk along Chaska Boulevard on the rail right of way yep. kind of between like Super America and into downtown and that underpass under 41. What's the timeline for that new trail? Probably 2021. Okay. And that wouldn't be through the capital improvement program. This is only to maintain our existing ones. That yep. has more to do with the tunnel that would be put under 41 <laughs> as part of the uh, 41 reconstruction project. Yep. Yep. Thanks. So our expenditures in 2019, the major ones, uh, continuing uh, to put the million dollars towards our CIP program. Uh, we have the new code compliance division. So we already had 1.5 positions for our community service officers in the police department. This would add another two and a half uh, people uh, or FTEs uh, to bring us up to a total of four employees within our community service uh, officer division uh, to deal with code compliance. Uh, our dollars for employee uh, wages and benefits, we, if you remember a couple meetings ago, we actually set the benefit increase uh, for our employer contribution at a 6% increase. Uh, and then the, uh, what we're, we're still working on the contracts, uh, but it's looking like at least from a wage increase, we're looking at 3%, which is what we had budgeted for and what we're seeing for the market out there. So that's still something that has to come forward to the council and have action taken on. Um, but what we're talking about in contract negotiations and what we actually budget for and what we're seeing in the market are all matching up, which is good. Uh, and then uh, one of the things that we also uh, are starting to look at, too, is uh, the MRA. So this was that pay study that we did last year. So, you know, one of the first steps in that is to make sure that everybody falls within their pay classification uh, zones for, for the positions. But the second thing that we really have to look at, and I think it became really evident to us as we started to look at the uh, data, is it's not just about people falling within their pay zones, but making sure that they're falling with in the pay zones comparable to where they are for years of service. And so we're doing, uh, uh, we're doing an analysis to see where do we, now that we have this data, where do our actual wage rates fall compared to where 
uh, somebody with that type of experience would fall uh, in comparable cities. And so that's going to take a little while to do, uh, but I think it's the next phase to make sure that we're keeping up with the average wage rates uh, for, for other cities out there. So that's something that's going to come back and you guys are going to see a lot more of, uh, but we're starting to do the work now to quantify that. Uh, fully funding our equipment acquisition, uh, so making sure that we're keeping up with equipment as it ages out, and sort of like we talked about before, we would use equipment certificates for that um, to, to fund those things. And most of the things in a general fund, um, you know, our dump trucks, for instance, are, I think they're 10 years or 12 years. So these are pieces of equipment that have quite a lifespan to them. So. Um, so we do uh, have a decision we'll have to make as we get into the springtime uh, of this next year about uh, our free trial period for body cameras for police officers will end. Uh, we want to make sure that we put dollars in there to be able to accommodate uh, should we want to continue forward uh, with that. Uh, so we have dollars budgeted for that. And then we have uh, half a support position included in the finance division <coughs> Uh, to really be able to keep up with uh, the increased reporting requirements that aren't just general fund. This is our, all of our enterprise funds that go across the, the spectrum, which is, I think, an important thing to point out. You know, our general fund, we spend a lot of time talking about our general fund and talking about our tax levy. Our overall budget is close to $80 million. Our general fund is $16 million. And of that, our tax levy is about $9 million. So... Uh, just over 10% of the revenue that we have to support all of our services comes from tax levy. The rest comes from basically pay for use services. And so that makes us very different from other cities. You know, when I came from Winstead, I mean, it was building permits and tax levy. I mean, those, those were the two things that made up the revenue uh, and, and water fees and stuff like that. But here we're very different where uh, you know, our tax levy only represents about 11 to 12 percent of our overall revenues in our in our overall budget. Uh, so uh, we spend a lot of time talking about, it, which is important because it's the one thing people can't choose. Uh, where you can choose to use a certain level of electricity or water, things like that. Taxes are a little different, so that's why we focus on it. But it is a it's a lesser ex uh, component of our overall budget than in a lot of cities then all other items would remain unchanged. So I already talked about uh, that based on new growth, inflation, and then that code compliance division that it would represent about a 7.1% increase. Um, and our tax capacity, if you remember, went up by 5.6%. So that's where it translates into this. When it really boils down to it, what people really care about is what does this mean for <clears throat> And so we do an average uh, house uh, assumption comparison. So the average house price in 2018 was uh, $289,300. We look at that same house in 2019 based on the average increase, I think it was 3.91% we saw in the average uh, existing property, would bring that same property's market value up to $299,100. So if you look at uh, what we're proposing for a tax levy and use those valuations, that home in 2018, last year, paid $831 for taxes. In 2019, they pay $871, which is a $40 increase across the entire year, uh, which represents a 4.8% increase. One thing to point out on that, that's average home. I took a look every year. I always tell you, what, what did mine come in at? Um, you know, mine came in at, I think it was a $25 increase. And so it's all dependent on what your valuation changed. Mm -hmm. Some, you know, a lot of times, uh, you know, well, we'll have people come up and say, well, my valuation went up by so much. Well, there can be improvements that have done to the house. There could have been comparable sales within the neighborhood that actually drove values up. It really depends on that valuation of the, of the building, but the average home out there would see about a $40 uh, increase. And that represents an increase in our tax rate uh, of about 1.8%. So 
So as far as our general fund revenues, you can see property taxes. This is not the entire property tax. One of the things, so our, we share our property taxes between our equipment acquisition fund and our general fund. So this represents the total share of tax dollars that actually come into our general fund. The remaining dollars go into our equipment acquisition fund. Uh, so you can see property taxes going into our, our franchise fee for electric and gas is about $4.3 million, uh, which is pretty similar to what our tax levy going into the general fund is. Uh, other franchise fee, that represents our cable franchise fee. Uh, licenses and permits, we have at about $1.39 million now. I would venture to say that by the time you see this come back in the 17th, that's probably going to be closer to about $1.3 million um, as we relook at some of that. Uh, we have our admin charges. So, you know, I mentioned that our total budget's $80 million. Uh, our general fund's $16 million. And so most of the services that we provide and the staffing we have are outside of our general fund, but all of our services like uh, Knowles department provides all payroll, uh, administration, which is in general fund, provides all HR, mm -hmm. uh, IT is provided through the general fund. So all these support services, administrative services that, that every department utilizes all get paid through the general fund. So the, each fund, mm -hmm. if they're going to properly support those functions there in the general fund, need to pay an administrative fee to the general fund to be able to support that. So that's what the administrative charges from the funds represent. So you can see a total uh, uh, revenue at six, about $16.9 million, which is about a 5.8% increase. As far as general fund expenditures, you know, again, it's about a 5.8% increase, uh, balances out at that 16.9 million. Uh, the only new things that are in there, there's some positions that were only funded for a half a year last year because they only worked for a half a year, so we needed to bring in the full funding. Uh, but the only new things uh, that we have in there would be our code compliance division, which is in our police department. Um, uh, the fire department, you can see full year of funding for inspections. So we brought in the new inspectors last year, but they didn't start till part way through the year. So we need to fully fund them. Uh, our communications person over here didn't start till later. So, uh, I guess we have to pay him for the full year this yeah. year. So, <laughs> yeah. so it, a lot of these represent positions that started halfway through last year that we budgeted only half a year that we need to full fund the, the full year. Uh, of that for 2019. So, uh, where does this put us in comparison to other cities? Uh, Chaska has always been very low property tax levy per capita. I like this analysis because um, you know we're able to look at what does it cost per person in the community, and so you can look at it per service. But everybody provides a little bit different service levels. But we can always break it down. A person is a person is a person. And so uh, you can see here that out of 87 metro municipalities, uh, we're sixth lowest uh, for ta property taxes per capita in the metro area. Uh, we're at $346 per capita. Uh, this is comparing our proposed changes compared to last year's uh, taxes for each of these uh, jurisdictions. So this assumes that they have a 0% increase in any of their tax levies, uh, which probably is not the case. Uh, I always throw Chanhassen in there because people like to compare there. Uh, you can see that Chanhassen is about in the middle of the, uh, uh, or a little uh, closer to the, the bottom, but they're about $427 uh, per capita. Uh, so it gives you sort of a sense of, of where uh, different cities uh, lie. But we, we were sixth lowest last year. Uh, we continue to be uh, in that same position for 2019 uh, with the proposed changes. And that makes us uh, not only sixth lowest in the metro area, but it also uh, keeps us the lowest tax levy per capita in Carver County. So the remaining budget schedule uh, for 2019 would be uh, December 17th, when we'd consider the adoption of the 2019 budgets and also establish that final tax levy. 
And then we'd also consider adopting the final enterprise fund budgets along with any changes, proposed rate changes that we've talked about for things like water rates or electric or things like that. So basically on January 1st, we're ready to move forward with, with everything. So with that, I can answer any questions or, uh, again, this is truth and taxation hearing, so if there's anybody that has questions or comments, uh, uh, this would be a time for them to be able to come up. Again, that's a quick overlay. We've seen this uh, presentation and gone through this uh, a bunch of times already. So um, it seems quick, but it has been gone over rather extensively already from our side. So, um, but any questions up here? Because this is a public hearing. Nope. All right. So I'm going to go ahead open the public hearing up at 747. Is there anyone that would like to come up and speak uh, regarding the truth in taxation? Last call. All right, we'll go ahead and close the public hearing at 748. Um, with that, I would entertain a motion to, um, do we have to approve? We're really not approving anything. What you're doing is establishing December 17th as the date oh. that you actually would do it. Okay. Thank you. Establishing December 17th at 7 o'clock in the Chaska City Hall Council Chambers. Move move. There's a motion. Is there a motion? Yep, so moved. So I have a motion by uh, Council Member Mung. Second by? No, second. Second by Councilman Eastlip. Um, and again, this is to uh, have the final budget hearing on December 17th mm -hmm. at 7 o'clock in the Chaska City Council Chambers. Mm -hmm. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries.